Hi, my name is Iris Sun Cooler, and we're going to spend a little time together with me teaching you how to make the Peacock Loop and Loop. It's a project that uses fusing. It is a lot of fun, pretty simple to do. This is a beginner's project. You'll want to wear some kind of glasses, whether you need them or not. You'll need them for safety reasons. And if you have long hair, like I do, you need to put it up because um, we don't want to have any kind of uh, accidents with hair catching on fire. All right, ready? Let's go. Not only are these tools important for today's project, but these are, for me, the most essential tools when working with wire. There's the round nose pliers, the chain nose pliers, and they're pointed at the end, and the flush cutters. And don't forget with the flush cutters, these are for flush cutting, not for general wire cutting purposes. So these are the three tools that you basically just can't live without if you're going to be a metalsmith. To form the loops, I use dowel rods. I have several different type at home in my toolbox, and some of them might be acrylic, some of them might be wood. I also have some metal ones, but this is just a quick sample of the styles of dowel rods. The most important part is the size, and I like to mark mine on the end. This is a 5 8 dowel rod, and again, it's acrylic, which is why it looks different. A 3 4 dowel rod. And for this one, you don't necessarily need a dowel rod. You can use a toothpick, a round toothpick, or a shish kebab stick. But if you're going to use a dowel rod, it's a 1 8 size dowel rod. Instead of using the 1 8 dowel rod, you can also use the round nose pliers, the tips of them. And this is a tapered awl. The important part is the taper so that the sides are not parallel. For example, these have the sides that are parallel, but this is tapered, so it comes to a cone shape. Careful, it's sharp. <laughs> and uh, this is just an additional tool to help you sort of poke through your design. It's not necessary, but it's a good optional tool. And this is also an optional tool. This is a sheet and wire gauge. I think this is one of the most important tools that you can have in your box. And because when you have wire and you have a lot of it, if the, if the tag falls off, this is how you're going to know if you have the right size. With any kind of projects where you have sizes to make the loops, you have to be sure to use the right gauge wire. Here's your basic setup for fusing and for drawing a bead, which is what we're going to be doing later. We've got the butane torch, the butane. Also, make sure that you've seen my torch talk to understand how to use the torch, how to fill it up, and what the setup is all about and general safety issues. We've got the soft kiln brick, crosslock tweezers, a tripod with a screen, and don't forget a jar with uh, your scraps in it because if you melt something down, don't think of it as a waste. It's just you can save your scraps and you can do other projects with them later. But what's important for these scraps is that you mark it fine silver and you don't get it mixed in with anything else. If you put one piece of sterling in there, and they look a lot alike, if you put just one piece in there, then you've contaminated the whole batch. I also have a small jar that I like to keep uh, when you use a Teflon pan, when the, when the metal drips into the pan, it often makes these little beads. And um, I like to save those for embellishment on other projects. The soft kiln brick is what you're going to use to fuse on, but you can also use it to draw a bead with if it's one of these longer versions. If you already have a tripod, you can use this as well to draw the bead on, but you can't use the tripod to fuse on. So, having the brick, you can do both. If you just have a tripod, you're going to have to buy a brick. So that's why I've included both of these. These are the fine silver wires that we're going to use. This one is 18 gauge, this one's 20 gauge. The 20 gauge is what we will use to make the actual links with and the 18 gauge is what we're going to make a clasp with. Both of these are fine silver. Fine silver means pure silver, so that's .999 as opposed to sterling. That's very important for fusing. The other thing is I always use dead soft wire. 
That way my loop sizes are consistent because of work hardening. Now we're going to start this project off with making our basic jump rings. So here we're using the 20 gauge wire. I usually don't like to cut off too much at a time. And by the way, if you'll notice, there are two, two little fasteners on this. Resist the temptation to take these off and get your wire out because you'll end up with a big mess. So I always keep two of these on here, even if they're loose, it prevents it from tangling up. Okay, so here is a fairly large piece. And here is my 5 8 dowel rod. I begin by taking the wire in the middle and winding it on. Very often I've seen my students pulling on the wire. Remember this isn't yarn or string, so pulling on it isn't really going to help you. It's more of a folding technique. And if you need the ends to be pushed down a little bit so that it ends in the round, because sometimes this part right here sticks up, I use the flat side of my chain plier just to give it a little push. You don't want to use your fingers to do that because you'll end up with sore fingers. And there is my coil. The idea here is that they're all consistent in size, nice and neat, and I've ended them in the round so that there's no waste. Now. If you're looking at your coil straight on, you'll notice that it's probably not level. The coils tend to go either down or up or maybe occasionally straight across, but the point is that when you go through here and do a flush cut, you're going to have to compensate for those angles because the goal is to create a right angle cut. Now I like to go through and cut these one at a time You'll want to go in and snip these one at a time because if you cut more than one, chances are you're going to chew them more than cut them. Because I've been doing this for quite a while, I can actually just go through and cut them and fuse them without flush cutting. But if you're just starting out, I do recommend you go through and flush cut both sides. What flush cutting means is that you're just taking off that little sharp point that's usually on one side with the flat or flush part of the flush cutters. These cutters you'll see are flat on one side and they have a valley on the other side. The valley side is the side that cuts the pinch and this is the side that cuts the flush part. So. Once you go through and cut them all, go back and cut off the pinch. So you've got basically two flat sides to work with. So I've gone through and I have flush cut each loop. So there's a flat right angle on each loop now. The next thing I need to do is I need to overclose it, which means you're sort of pushing it past itself on both sides like this, and then butting up the joint like that so that it is closed and it has some tension. I've created a spring. Now, a little fine tuning might include the chain pliers just to make sure that there's not a step. When you fuse, if you've got a step in here, it's going to translate into a lump or a weak spot, a thin place in the link. And if you look real carefully, you'll see now you can't even tell where that join is because it is so lined up. So I'm going to have to go through every single link and do this very carefully. Overclose it a bit, set it, make sure the join is flush all the way around. If this isn't matching up, you might need to go back in and trim it out a little bit, just like that. Now I'm also finding the older I get, the more likely I am to need a pair of glasses to check this. So there we go. So I'm gonna go through and set all of these. Now, what happens if you don't do this is that 
when you heat up your rings later, they're going to relax because they're going to do what's called, um, they're going to go through a phase called annealing. So they're going to relax. And if you don't create this tension by overclosing, they might just come apart when they relax. And this is a way to keep them closed once you heat it up. When I teach this in a classroom, I usually don't have my students make all the loops all at one time. What I like for them to do is to make a batch and then go through the fusing process and then see how they did because they might have to improve on something on how they trimmed and cut them. And it's better if you just practice on a small amount and see how you do before you use up all the wire doing more. So just to reiterate, all of these have flush cuts. So they're coming together um, without any gaps or with minimal gap at all. In fact, you can't see any gap. And to fuse successfully, the two sides have to touch. I used to tell my students that they should touch about 90%, and that kind of brought out the type A in everyone. So now I'm more like, well, make sure that it's at least touching 40 or 50%. It's sort of a trade-off, because if you have good contact, you're going to do a better job fusing, but it also depends on your torch skills. So if your torch skills are great, but your contacts are not that great, you can probably still fuse pretty good. Or if your contacts here are really good and your torch skills need a little work, you can probably fuse fairly well. The point is one or the other, but it's better to have both good joins here and good torch skills. So let's get ready and fuse these. I have laid down my rings on this soft kiln brick and I just want to talk about how I've laid this out and prepare you for fusing before we actually do it. I also want to mention that we dim the lights for later so you'll be able to see the flame better. This by the way is a little carbon mark on the brick and that doesn't hurt anything. Okay so let's start with the brick. When you get these bricks because they are mined they could look different from one side to the other. You want, when you're fusing flat like we are right now, you want to choose the side of the brick with the least amount of holes. Now this brick is porous to begin with, but you want to make sure that it's the cleaner side of the two if you have that option. For example, right here is a hole. It's not very big, but I do want to be careful not to straddle the link on top of any larger holes because in that spot if this wire were to go over this hole that spot right there would heat up faster and it would melt down. So the other thing I wanted to mention is that every single join is in a six o'clock position. In other words, it's, it's here, 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 here. The reason why I've lined them up that way is so that I don't have to hunt for the join. Even if I can't see it clearly, I know where it is. Actually, I should be able to see it clearly if I have my glasses on. But that way, I can repeat the motion of fusing over and over and over, and I don't really have to adjust much. The other thing is that I created a margin, especially back here, because when I'm coming in with a torch, if I accidentally overshoot my flame, it's not going directly down onto the table. I've got a little bit of a margin here to work with. Remember that you're not supposed to torch this pan or the table. So it's better to end up torching the edge of this back here. And the same thing goes with this side of the brick. I've left a little bit of a margin here as well. I've laid out my loops like cookies on a cookie sheet so that if, for example, I'm torching this one, there isn't one directly behind it to start melting down. I've just turned everything from this position to this position. The reason why is that I'm right-handed. In order to fuse evenly, I have to heat this link up symmetrically. And if, if everything is tilted the other way, I'm going to tend to warm up the right side of the link more. So what I've done to compensate is I've turned the brick so that when I come in like this, it's not awkward for me to heat both sides of that join. Okay, here, here's how I'm going to fuse. I'm going to take my torch, and I like to describe this 
to my class like this. Pretend this is a runway and your torch is an airplane. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come down onto the runway first. And that's a good way for you to be able to see where the hottest part of your torch tip is. Remember it's at the tip of the bright blue cone, but better yet, I will be able to see the brick heat up. And that's my signal that I've reached the right focal point. Now the way I fuse is that I do not apply my torch heat directly onto the metal. Because if you do that, chances are you're gonna melt it down. What I'm doing is I'm using this brick which is a refractive material. That means it reflects heat back. That's why these are soft kiln bricks. They use these to build kilns with, and the whole point behind that is that it reflects heat back, so it's more energy efficient. It's not as much of a heat sink. So I'm actually using this brick to reflect heat back from underneath. So my goal is to create almost like a little oven. It's to heat the brick up so the brick heats my loop from the bottom up and plus the, loop, the heat from the top of the flame. The whole thing, once it reaches the right point, the whole thing, the flash point actually, the whole thing will melt together. Now, one of the things that happens is if you put too much heat on one place, it's gonna melt down or pull all the metal to it. One of the principles behind heating metal is that the metal, once it starts to flow, is going to go to the hottest place. So, I'm going to come into the runway, I'm going to preheat around my loop, I'm going to heat it up in the middle, and you'll be able to see it because of the color of the brick, it should be orange, and you'll also be able to hear it. Then once I've preheated around and in the middle of the loop, I'm going to swish back and forth between the three o'clock and the nine o'clock position. If this were a clock, the three would be here, nine would be here, and the join is in the six o'clock position. So I'm going to preheat around in the middle, swish back and forth, and then focus the heat right here, which is not on the join. It's in front of the join. So I'm heating the brick up from underneath. So once the metal starts to flow, it's wanting to flow to the hottest place, which I will make right below the join. And the wet metal, when it touches with capillary action, it's going to join or fuse right there. So that's the strategy. So let's do it. Here I come in with the torch. I'm preheating and you can see it because the brick is getting orange. You can also hear it. This is a great way, listening to it is a great way to hear if you're in that right spot. Okay, now the loop has gotten light orange. Now swish and down, swish and down. There, it's fused. Now this one, as I'm looking at it with my little magnifier on, looks like it's got a step in it, so let's see if it fuses or if it melts down. Oh, there it goes, it fused. Now, I don't know if you can get the detail on this, but very often you'll see it hit that critical mass point and fuse when your flame isn't even on it or near it. There we go, getting ready. There we go. When I see it start to get wet, I pay attention to where it's getting wet because that's where I'm putting the most heat. And because I'm right-handed, it's probably gonna be more on the right side. So I have to adjust my angle as I go. But see how I come down here and pause? I think that one's fused, yeah, okay. Preheat, I'm looking for the orange on the brick. Going around the outside, a little bit in the middle. I've got my dull orange glow, swish and down, swish and down, and I believe it's fused. Okay, preheating around. These are only uh, 20 gauge, so they're fairly thin. Oops, that one's got a lump, so that means I overheated a little bit, but 
let's move on. Let's see, we'll go to this one down here. So I might have been a little heavy handed on that last one because it did get a lump. There we go. The idea is to have a nice, clean fusing join that you can't even tell that it was fused there. And the advantage to heating the brick up in this way is that it gets fused all the way through to the other side. There we go. That one got a tiny little bit of a lump. The trick is also when to know when to stop. There we go. Okay. Now, you don't actually need to go in there and pick every single one up. All you have to do is you can take your tweezers and just roll it. I find that this is more efficient because I'm not wasting time picking it up. Some of these have a little bit of a lump. What I'm looking for is to see if it's if there's a definite line on the back, it could be a problem, but if it's just an impression of where it was, it's okay. These look pretty good, and we'll find out in a few minutes when we get to the next step to see whether or not they're fused strong enough. This is the one that I think that had the step in it, and there's still a step there, but it did fuse. Now, the way that I learned to fuse, um, I learned that you do not quench fine silver. So what we're not going to do is quench these, and in fact, you can see they're already cool, so there's really no need to quench. But one of the problems with quenching, especially for loop-and-loop -loop patterns, is that it shocks the fine silver and it creates some micro cracks in there. And you really put these through a lot of work and uh, by the time we get done folding them and making the chain out of them, they're going to be pretty work hardened already. So we don't want to add to that stress by quenching them. And again, you know, there's really no need to quench because here we go, they're already cooled off. Now that I've gone through and fused all the loops, I want to go through and check for any sort of problem areas. If you can see a lump or a bump, put that lump or bump on one end, doesn't matter which end, but one end of these round nose pliers because we're going to actually get rid of that. And remember the tiny little dowel rod? This is 1 8 You can also use a round toothpick or a shish kebab stick. I'm going to put it on there and create a little neck. Now the goal is to have these consistent from loop to loop, which is why I am using something to shape it on. And the other thing that's really important is that the metal is touching right there. So if you have any inconsistencies, they should be up here. Let me take a look at another one real quick. I'm not 100% sure that this got fused, but we'll find out because if it's not, it would pop right now. So the little lump and bump is right there. I'm going to put that on the dowel rod. This actually isn't as awkward as it looks. I'm just trying to get some angles here so you can see what I'm doing. The two parts of the metal are touching and any inconsistency again are up here because we're going to ball this part up. It's called drawing a bead and we're going to turn this whole part right here into a, a ball of wire. These to me look a lot like insect wings and you're going to hear me refer back to that later. What I'm looking at now is that all of these little heads are equal or fairly equal in size to each other and that's because I used the dowel rod. Also by, by turning these into ovals, none of them popped which means they actually were fused and if there's any inconsistencies in the fusing on the join or any lumps and bumps, I've put them here where the little head is because that's where we're going to draw a bead or ball up the wire. I've taken my brick and set it on its side, the uh, vertically, 
so it's tall. And here is the cross-locking tweezers and I'm grabbing the end of one of these little insect wing type loops so that it's in this direction with minimal amount of contact with the tweezer and I'm hanging it over the edge of the brick. So the brick is actually just serving as a base for me to hang this out in space, cantilevering it out. Is that a real word? Cantilevering it out. So the next shot, we're gonna move everything around so that you can see better what I'm doing, but this is basically how I've set it up. Now I'm getting ready to draw the bead. The most important thing about drawing a bead is that you're heating this up from underneath and that your tray is underneath your piece in case it drips. And very often it will drip if you've gone a little too far. So I'm coming in from underneath and just so you can see the angle of my torch, I'm tipping it sideways. The hottest part is at the end of the bright blue cone. Now watch carefully, what's gonna happen is it's gonna break, two beads are gonna ball up and when they touch right there, I stop. The goal is to stop when the two beads join together into one. And what I don't want you to do is to show off and make this part as big as you can because it'll take up more wire and then the problem is that every link is gonna be a different size. So you want a nice round plump bead there but again, you're not trying to make the biggest bead that you can possibly make. Let's do one more take so you can see it again. I'm coming in with my torch flame from underneath and actually I'm going at an angle so that I don't torch the table. Here we go, heating from underneath going up. It's broken, it comes together and right now, right there. That's when it becomes nice, round, and plump, and there aren't any sharp parts left in it. It's just a nice, round, plump bead. I also wanted to show you how to use the tripod. It's basically the same concept that you're elevating your piece above the tray so that you can ball up the wire. So the tripod's a nice tool because it gives the, the height that you need to get your torch under there because you don't want to do this too close to the table. So let's ball this one up as well. There we go. That one actually, that one might be a little bit too much ball and I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little sharp point right there. And what that is, it's the wire running through there that still sort of hasn't melted right there. So this one may or may not work, and we'll take a look at it again, because what I want is a nice round smooth ball. This link might end up a tad too small, but we'll find out. Here I've got a sampler of some of the insect wings that I've just made. I also wanted to remind you that if you have scraps, and this is left over from the beginning when I made the loops, be sure and save these in something like a jar and mark it fine silver so you don't get it contaminated by any other kinds of metal, including sterling silver. These kind of scraps you can use for other projects and you can also return them to refinery or various places that have the services to um, get either more wire or credit for more metal. You might already have seen some of these while you were working. This is what happens when the metal drips and it drips into or onto Teflon, into the Teflon pan. What happens because Teflon is designed to not have any surface or to reduce surface tension, what happens is that the metal balls up and it drips and it rolls. So I like to save these separately because they're great for embellishment, especially if you're doing some soldering projects. And um, if you've ever heard of granulation, these are wonderful for granulation and they can be fused as well. Now we're going to take the loops that we just made and we're going to form them into this shape. I like to call this the insect wing shape because it reminds me of 
little insect wings that I used to find when I was a child outside. And we're going to fold them up into this other shape. Now I've created this whole vocabulary to describe what I do because very often I will be teaching in a classroom full of people. So you're going to hear my little names for everything. So let's start with this one. I've got my round pliers, round nose pliers, and I'm going to stretch, not actually stretch it, but sort of reform it into a gentle oval and then pinch it in the middle so it has a little waist to it. And you see the, the head on top and it's like a little person. Now I'm going to use the round pliers and take, if this were a person, I'm going to take the feet and I'm going to fold the feet up so they touch just under the chin. That's a little off center, so I'm going to move it just a hair. There we go. Now, I like to call this a yogi who's doing um, a little yogi position. And the anatomy here is going to help you understand what I'm doing. So here's the head. The feet are touching the chin. Now using my round nose pliers or the tapered awl, I'm going to go into the back of the neck without poking myself and I'm going to come out where the feet are. So that's into the back of the neck coming out where the feet are and I'm going to pinch it down here and hold on to it and just kind of plump it up. And now I'm going to go the opposite direction. So this is the very first link. And if you think of it as being a person, it's a little yogi laying on their back. Here's the head, the back, and then the feet touch the chin. Okay, so that's the first link. Now, for the second link, I'm going to stretch it a little bit into an oval. They're sort of oval shaped already. Then I'm going to just pinch in the waist. So this looks a lot like the very first one. Now, if I have my little yogi laying on its back, I'm going to take the feet of the second one Go into the back of the neck, turn it where that waist is, remember this waist right here, so that's going to allow me to turn it, hold on to the first one, and now I'm going to pull on this and collapse it like that, and then use the tapered awl to help me align everything so that the feet are underneath the chin or just touching the chin. And I'm going to plump it out from both sides. The first side is from the back of the neck. The second time plumping it out is from the front. This also helps push the feet more up against the chin. So in profile, it looks like that. And you'll see that there's enough room in here for this first link to move freely and that's important because when you have chain like this you want it to flow naturally and freely. If it gets stuck or jammed up inside then that's probably going to break later. Now it's important that all of these are lined up in the same way. Again if you imagine a yogi laying on its back with the feet up touching the chin. For the third link, it's pretty much the same thing. I'm taking my round pliers, holding on to it, not really stretching it, but just holding on to it, giving it some tension so that I can pinch in a little waist, and then making sure that my little yogis are lined up so their backs are all on one side. I go, I take the feet and go through the back of the neck, then pull on it and bend it up so that the feet are ending up right under the chin, right there. Open it out, plump it up from the back, 
turn it around, plump it up from the front, and that's pretty much it. I sort of go in and tweak it, making sure that they're all the same. I want the feet touching the chin, and that's, that's basically it. I finished my chain now. As you can see, it's about seven and a half inches or so. There's probably about 33, 34 links in here. And just want to show you what this looks like from all angles. I'm going to rotate it. I've got my little yogis on their back doing something that's like the plow. And again, Actually, now I have them on their backs. <laughs> there we go. And they're going, or wait a minute. There we go. So you can see the ball suspended on the inside and again, a different orientation. Now let's look at how to make the clasp. I use the 3 4 dowel rod and the 18 gauge wire and did the same thing I did earlier. I wrapped it around here, made a coil, and snipped off a piece. Took my flush cutters and trimmed it. Now what I'm going to do is take the chain and I'm going to use, let's see which end. I'm going to use the end that has the head on it because this clasp is actually going to hook into the opposite end which looks like two feet coming together. So I have to attach the chain. Here's the 18 gauge 3 fourths of a dowel rod loop. I'm over closing, setting it so it's nice and springy and flush all the way around. Now for my brick, I've looked for a spot here that has a hole and let's see if it's big enough. Nope, it's not quite big enough. The idea is that I'm going to put part of my chain, the beginning of the chain, into this hole but this hole is not big enough. So this is what I was talking about earlier with finding or using different sides of your brick. This is a side of a brick that has a few more pockets in it and I'm just going to make this the right size by kind of crushing the brick with the back of my crosslock tweezers. Now let's see if this is big enough and it looks like it is. The goal is to give my chain a place to rest. There we go so that the part with the join on the loop is on a table out in front. So this is all flat and the join which is right here is as far away from the chain as possible. Now I'm actually going to come and approach it this way and I have to turn the brick a little bit so let's see if we can do this all in one shot. I'm right-handed so I want to come in this way. There's my join right here. It's far away from the back of this. I like to tell my students that if I accidentally fuse all this back here then um, you'll not only have a part of a bracelet but you'll also have a nice little earring component. But we're going for bracelet here. So let's see if we can do this in one clean swoop. I'm going to light the torch and here we go. Okay, so I'm coming in, heating up the brick. This time I'm only going to go back and forth and down. I don't want to heat, preheat the entire piece because I don't want to fuse it all together in the back end. And right about now. Okay, it's fused. We can check it. Looks good on this side. I think it looks pretty good on the other side. If for some reason it didn't fuse, I'll find out in a minute when I stretch it. Um, and then we'll, we'll see what happens. But I think it's fused. 
Okay, so let me let this cool off. It's going to take about a minute. And we don't want to put this onto the pliers while it's hot. Now we're going to form the clasp. So I'm just stretching it. Now's a good chance. Don't pull this too tight, but it's a good chance to find out if you did a good job fusing and it looks like it worked. If there are any lumps and bumps or weak places, you want to hide them so you can put them sort of down here. This is kind of similar to what we did before. I'm going to make that little bone shape like that. I'm holding on to it and now I'm closing up the rest of it. And if the round nose pliers are a little slippery, you can also use the chain pliers to go down. You'll need to have room here. There should be enough roundness in this part so that there's nice movement in the chain. If for some reason you close this up too much, you can go back in and open it up with these. Now, here comes the magic part. So here we have the clasp attached. So I like to describe this as a snow ski or a water ski from the side. I'm going to just tip this end up a little bit like that, like a ski. Then I'm going to hold it at the base of the pliers and start rolling it up. You might have to adjust it a little bit, back it off a little bit, but there you go. Voila! There's your fused clasp. And just to prove that it really works, we'll hook it in here. You want this to be closed enough to give a comfortable little snap to get it in and out. So you can close this up a little bit. You want this little ski tip up enough. And if for some reason this part doesn't fit in here, it could be that the tongue, this end of it, is a little bit too big. You can always squeeze it down a little bit with the chain pliers. But there it is. This is the chain that we just made and it's a 5 8 dowel with 20 gauge wire. And I just wanted to show you that you can make these larger and thicker. This one, for example, is a 3 4 dowel rod and it's using 18 gauge. And this one is a 3 4 dowel rod using 16 gauge. Just to show you how much thicker this one is, here's a single loop compared to this one. They're both 3 4 dowel rods, but this is 18 gauge and this is 16 gauge. So I just wanted to show you that with a little bit of experimenting, you can use different size dowel rods and different size or thicknesses or gauges of wire to make a variation on this design theme. All right, that's the end of this program. I wanted to mention a couple more things. One is how to finish your chain. Now it's okay to tumble your chain one time because tumbling it also makes it harder. So the first time is okay, it'll shine it up, make it harder, but if you keep tumbling it, it's gonna get more and more brittle and it could break. Just remember, when you're wearing your chain, you're also work hardening it because it moves and it hits things and things like that. So another quick way to finish your piece off is to use a jeweler's brass brush and combine that with Dawn, D-A-W-N, which is a, um, a dishwashing liquid. You'll want to use blue in particular. Use the jeweler's brass brush, the blue Dawn liquid, and you can brush your piece. Now, what the soap does is that it not only cleans it, but it also works as a lubricant to prevent pieces of the brass embedding themselves into your silver. 
And the reason why it has to be blue, not pink, not yellow, not green, but blue, is because the soap will actually color the silver. And as we know, blue makes white look whiter and brighter. We have blue crystals in our toothpaste, we have bluing in our laundry detergent. In the Middle East, some women wear blue eye drops to make the whites of their eyes look whiter. So that's why you want to go for the Blue Dawn. And one more thing about that product is that Dawn is a very strong detergent, but it doesn't have a lot of extra chemicals or things in it like moisturizer. That's why they use it for the oil spill, the oil cleanups for the oil spills, like on all the birds and animals and whatnot. So let's see what's left. Um, we welcome your feedback. You've seen a lot of the products that are available here at Beejucation, and I believe that might be it. Um, so you can contact me through Beejucation, and I hope you had a great time. Bye.